Morning everyone and welcome to the fourth meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system, but as meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used during the session. The only item on the agenda today is for the committee to take evidence on progress of work on the fourth replacement crossing from the project team. Therefore, can I welcome David Climey, project director, and Lawrence Shackman, project manager of the fourth replacement crossing team at Transport Scotland. And can I invite Mr Climey to make a short opening statement? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to be able to report uh, continuing good progress on all aspects of the work for the FRC project since our last appearance before the committee in March of last year. The three completed contracts, 5 ITS, M9 Junction 1A and the Contact and Education Centre are continuing to operate well and progress on the principal contract for the Queen's Ferry Crossing and the approach roads continues on time for completion by the end of 2016. Overall, this progress has allowed a further reduction in the project budget range from 1.4 to 1.45 billion to 1.35 to 1.4 billion, which was announced last October. This means that the project has released 195 million pounds of savings since the construction started in June 2011. Focusing on progress on the principal contract, and you might find it helpful to, to refer to the plans that we've supplied uh, for this. Uh, on the south side, the new B800 bridge is being constructed alongside the, the existing South Queen's Ferry to Kirk Liston Road, with the steel bridge beams having been lifted into position last autumn and the bridge deck concreting currently in progress. The A904 has been rerouted across the new South Queen's Ferry Junction and the B924 in the same area has recently been rerouted to allow the excavation work for the new M90 road cutting to the north of the junction to start in the near future. On the Queen's Ferry crossing, the progress has been clearly visible over the past 12 months as the towers have climbed ever higher, the first section of the bridge deck have been erected and the construction of the viaducts and their supporting piers has made marked progress. When we reported to you last March, the centre tower was leading the way with the north and south towers about 20 metres behind. As expected, the flanking towers have caught up and indeed overtaken the centre tower, reaching bridge deck level last summer and now well past halfway in total height. The tower cranes for the north and the centre towers are now actually above the height of the fourth road bridge towers. On the viaducts, the steelwork for the south approach has all been delivered, assembled, welded and painted, and the focus has now shifted to the north approach viaduct. The gantry crane and the assembly workforce have all moved across the north side and a large tent structure has been installed to provide as much weather protection as possible for the welding and painting works. Many people will have seen the impressive sight of the large floating crane working around the towers in September and October last year, which installed temporary trestles, working platforms and the first four bridge deck units at each tower. This operation went very smoothly and benefited from a period of calm, settled weather. The large blue structures on the deck sections, which were also installed by the floating crane, are the lifting gantries, which will be used to lift the remaining deck sections into position. In the Rosyth Marine Yard, 72 deck units are currently stored, and the concrete deck has been installed on 15 of these, working inside the casting shed to ensure factory quality. On the north side roadworks, the B981 from North Queen's Ferry has been rerouted to the west of the Dunfermline Water Treatment Works, and the large steel girders which will form the Ferry Toll Viaduct have been assembled, and the first three were lifted into position earlier this month. Work on the bridges to carry the northbound M90 across the new Ferry Toll Junction has included the lifting in of the concrete beams uh, late last year, and the concrete bridge decks are now being constructed. In addition to the physical progress and across the project, we continue to engage with the public, schools and stakeholders on an ongoing basis, making use of a wide range of communication techniques, with the contact and education centre being the focus of these activities. This has resulted in very positive media coverage and community relations have been very good, with much positive feedback from our recent project annual update briefings at the end of January, which were attended by over 400 people. We also continue to monitor the performance of the two road contracts completed earlier in the project, and the performance of these remains positive. Overall, 2014 was a year of significant and highly visible progress, and we're confident that this will continue in the year ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Climey, for that very helpful update on the construction um, progress to date. Um, there clearly has been um, significant progress uh, to date. Can you give us a little indication of what the further um, physical progress um, milestones will be between now and completion of the project? Certainly, yes. Um, going through area by area, if I may, um, on the towers, we're currently uh, at poor 30 or 31 out of 54. Um, the first cable installation uh, to support the decks occurs at poor 40, and we expect to be at that point by the late spring of this year. The towers will then carry on up to their final height, which is 54 uh, pours, and they'll all be there by the summer of 2015. On the cable stayed bridge deck itself, the deck lifting will start in the late spring, and it will take about a year to install all of the deck, building out the fans from each tower, and all of that will carry on simultaneously. And that will be followed by the road surfacing and all the M&E works, which will be carried out during the summer of 2016. The south approach viaduct deck, the concreting of that will start in the late spring and will run through till early 2016. On the north approach viaduct, the assembly work, which is currently underway, will be complete in the summer. And one of the key operations will be the launching of the north approach viaduct out over the north side piers, N2 and N1, which we expect to happen in the late summer of 2015. The deck will then be concreted in the spring of 2016, and at that point we will have a complete structure from end to end of the bridge, north approach viaduct, the cable stayed bridge deck, and the south approach viaduct. On the south side on the roads, the B800 bridge, which I, I mentioned earlier, uh, that will be fully open to traffic in the summer, and we will then be able to demolish the existing bridge, and the final road connections on the south side will be complete in the autumn of 2016. On the north side of the ferry toll viaduct, the girders are being installed now. That will be completed during this month and next month. And the deck will be complete and concreted in the late summer of this year. Perhaps an important point to mention is that on the um, main line, the A90, going through the project, because of the roadworks at ferry toll and having to tie those in, uh, we will be installing average speed cameras on the main road um, from the Scotston Junction in the south through to Admiralty in the north. We expect that on the northbound side, those will be installed in the late spring of this year and on the southbound side in the summer of this year. And those will be in operation until the completion of the project. Those will reduce the speed limit from the current 50 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour. We decided that we'd have it in operation right over the fourth road bridge as well, because one thing we've specifically noted is that traffic is slowing down on the fourth road bridge looking at what we're doing. There's no doubt that there's been a lot of distraction there. So it makes sense to have the 40 mile an hour average speed limit to, to, to uh, control the traffic flow right through that entire area. But the difference between the three miles at 50 miles an hour and 40 miles an hour is less than one minute in travel time. So we think the impact is, is going to be very insignificant. And based on our experience with Fife ITS and M9 Junction 1A, the average speed camera has actually helped the traffic flow rather than inhibited it. That's very helpful, thank you. Um, would it be fair then to say that the project is currently on time and within the revised budget range of 1.53 to 1.4 billion? The, it's, it's, it's certainly on time, yes, and the, the, the budget range is, is 1.35 to 1.4 billion. The top, top end is 1.4 billion, and that's as announced last October, and certainly still very much on track for that, yes. <clears throat> and um, what, what are we looking at as the, um, the completion date for the project without one to tempt fate? I've been asked that many times recently, and I think with, with just under two years to go, it would be rash to try and speculate on a precise date. Okay, um, let, let's not do that then. But thank you. Give us, a, give us some indication. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll stick to what I've said every time I've, I've come here, which is that the end of 2016 will be fully open to traffic. Okay, we will settle for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can you highlight any key events then that are due to occur in the next six months beyond what you, you've told us today? I think I covered most of the um, key things that are going to happen, right. but obviously the, the two ones that I, I, I want to focus on in terms of technical challenge, perhaps, are the launch of the North Approach Viaduct. That's a very large piece of steelwork. We're assembling all of it behind the North Abutment at the moment. So that's going to be 6,000 tonnes of steel that will be launched over about a three-day period in the late summer. Um, that presents quite a technical challenge in, in launching that out for, a, for nearly 200 metres um, across the... the, the um, those piers and also we start the, the deck lifting operation 
um, which is lifting up a 750 ton deck unit with steel and concrete fixed onto it, lifting those up into position using the blue lifting gantries either side of each tower. Uh, that's due to start in the late spring. Uh, that has a number of challenges associated with it in terms of the barge, positioning the barge, actually lifting the deck unit, fitting it onto what's already there. And once we've been through all those technical challenges, um, those are the two real key ones that we have to get over. At that point, we can say, well, we've done everything now, everything at least once, so we'll have more confidence in going forward and, and, and uh, finishing on time. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add at this stage, Mr Shackman? Um, just to say that I think um, in the next six months the, the B800 bridge will be completed, um, which is number one on the plan, um, and the old bridge will be um, shortly demolished thereafter. And I think the ferry toll viaduct, which is number six on the north side, will also be uh, nearing completion as well towards the end of the year. Great. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Michael, do you have a point on this? It was just a, a slight further question. The committee were, uh, had an external visit to Fourth Ports uh, on Monday of this week, and um, w w one of the people we, we spoke to there mentioned that um, there were a number of kind of civil engineering firsts associated with the bridge. I think, if I'm if I'm correct in saying that uh, that included um, the the longest continuous concrete pour ever, and you know. That kind of thing, you know, in some ways, if we're, if, if we're at the cutting edge of civil engineering in this project, that, I think, is of interest to Parliament and to the wider public. And, you know, I would certainly be interested in, in hearing a bit more about that aspect of things. Apologies to my colleagues if they're not as interested as I am. <laughs> Very pleased to get a question like that. Um, you're right, there are a number of firsts on this job. Um, the, the particular pour that you refer to was when we filled up the, the South Tower caisson with concrete. We'd excavated it all out underwater, and at that point we then had to fill it up with concrete, underwater concrete, entirely underwater. And you're, you're correct in saying that we believe that was the largest continuous underwater concrete pour ever undertaken in the world. And that took a continuous 15-day period to, to put that in place, and that involved about 17,000 cubic metres of concrete, so roughly 40,000 tonnes in weight. And it was very important that we were able to supply that from our, our own batching plant in Rosyth. So they set up our, our own batching plant in Rosyth, so all the, the concrete is manufactured on the site within our own control. It's then put onto four barges, which have mixers on it, which continually shuttled backwards and forwards to the South Tower. Um, and another point that's, that not, ha hasn't been done yet, which is coming up, is we are the longest three-towered cable-stayed bridge in the world. And when we start building out the decks from the centre tower, we will we'll reach a point when we have them not quite connected up to the fans coming out from the North Tower and the South Tower, when we'll actually have the longest uh, balanced cantilever in the world. And that, that point, obviously, is a pretty key one in terms of resistance to wind and all that side of things. And it's actually one of the, one of the key design criteria for the bridge itself. When the bridge is finished, it actually takes far less load on the centre tower than when it's at that position, not quite connected up to the fans from the north and the south. Could I ask you, sorry, with your indulgence, convener, I mean, Scotland's got a very proud civil engineering history, going back to Telford, the Stevenson brothers and so on. It seems to me that this is in that kind of general orbit. Um, I would certainly be interested in more information on these kind of, um, you know, you know f things that we should celebrate about this bridge uh, beyond just the generality of it. And I'd, I'm sure maybe some of my committee colleagues, if you could provide f further written information, because <coughs> I do believe we should celebrate these things. On Mike, Mike's point, um, are there any plans to have a visitor centre that would... Um, showcase the, the achievement that this will represent? Well, we already have the contact and education centre, which we're using very much to, to sell um, the engineering um, excellence, if I can use that word, of, of the bridge construction, and not only our bridge, but also the fourth road bridge and the fourth bridge, which is obviously just about to have its uh, 125th anniversary. So it's a really very unique setting. And we have the, the contact centre at the moment, and we literally have thousands of, of people um, passing through that building. Um, I think it's about 23,000 people we've now had either on a school um, education visit or people coming for a presentation or family open days, that kind of things. So that they're already experiencing um, the engineering um, 
that's that's happening outside of the, of the window of the building and obviously the, the committee be very welcome to to come back and visit the the contact center again um going we, we envisage that building going through beyond the um, opening of the bridge um, there is some discussion as part of the the fourth bridges forum um, to, to see what the the uh, the the ultimate sort of visitor attractions are in the area and that's a sort of separate exercise but I think everyone who's working on the project would like to, to make sure that there is something that um, people can come to to visit and experience um, all the three bridges. Thank you. David. Uh, thank you. Uh, Eva, we raised earlier questions about finance of the bridge. Uh, perhaps I should declare an interest that in the last session I spent many months in the Bill Committee uh, so effectively I felt I was living in uh, dreaming about the fourth crossing, which is a very sad state of affairs. The question I, I raised at the time to the Minister was, I'm very, was about European structural funds, and I appreciate it might be the one that our witnesses can answer today, and it may be one for the Minister. Uh, that is the issue around securing European structural funds for the bridge. Um, the witnesses will be aware that 10T funding is available in Europe, particularly if it was part of the trans-European uh, transport network. I do understand that there's a couple of unsuccessful bids and there's some techie issues about how it might cut across the block grant. But nevertheless, on the basis that we had received substantial funding, that may well have cut costs for Scottish taxpayers. Have our witnesses any evidence at all about this um, that would be useful for the committee in its deliberations today? You're correct in that um, we did make two applications for the 10T funding in the early stages of the project. Um, what we found is that these tend to be, uh, there are some very specific criteria that are attached to those um, 10T funding, those 10T funds, um, and therefore we had to very much try to, to shoehorn the, the, the large project into very specific criteria to try to see if we, we could be um, eligible for those sort of things. And one area that we tried to focus on in the, in the early applications was to do with the, um, the ITS, the Intelligent Transport System, to see if there was a way of um, using that to, to access these funds. Um, unfortunately, we, we were not successful in the two applications that we made. Um, but certainly it's something that we do each year when the, when the applications open. We do look at the, the current criteria for the 10T funding to see if there is any uh, way of getting access to it. But I think for a very large project as we are, it can be quite difficult to meet the specific criteria that are attached to these sort of funds. Thank you. Perhaps a very brief follow-on, uh, convener. Could, you, could perhaps our witnesses confirm then, is the, is the fourth crossing currently part of the Trans-European Transit Network? Because I understand when I was raising this some a number of years ago, there was still some debate about this with Europe. What's the current criteria? And is there any further work we need to do with Europe for perhaps smaller projects that could then be eligible? I must say I'm not absolutely sure on that. So I think perhaps I'll, I'll take some advice on that and provide you with some, some information on that uh, following the, the appearance today. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Alex. Thank you very much. I've got a, a couple of minor questions, and some of them are on issues that we've covered to some extent already. Uh, first of all, the Edinburgh Evening News recently reported that construction chiefs, and I suppose that's what you are, uh, thought that the project may come in under budget and ahead of schedule. First of all, on budget, did the figures that you gave us uh, earlier in this meeting cover the latest estimate and take into account that speculation? Yes, they do. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm aware that uh, the... You know, as we get towards the end of the project, the scope for that figure changing uh, becomes very limited. Do you think that that figure will most likely be the final uh, re-estimate of constru construction costs that we see? No, I think it's fair to say that we remain optimistic. There's still possibilities for some f further reduction, um, particularly with regard to inflation. I mean, obviously, at the moment, we're seeing extremely low inflation. We still have just under two years of exposure to the inflation. And we certainly, in the projections that we've made, we haven't assumed that the experience to date is definitely going to be um, to continue for the duration of the project. We've, we've always maintained, I think as we've said before, a 2% per annum a minimum figure, an 8% per annum maximum figure in terms of the future inflation, and that we didn't want to assume that the, the good experience so far would necessarily be repeated. So there's certainly still an opportunity there. I would also say that um, in, in concluding these projects, the final account with the contractor is always an extremely important part of it. We have an extremely good relationship with the contractor. There are currently no outstanding uh, claims or disputes that we have with them, but obviously it's important that we maintain that relationship going forward. Um, but I'm optimistic that uh, we will be able to do that. Relations are extremely good. Um, so there's, there's still a possibility, and I couldn't put it any stronger than that, that we, we may be able to get some further savings yet. 
The, the speculation also suggested that the bridge might be completed ahead of schedule and not with sun and the fact that the conveners already had a go at you to see if you can get a, an opening date. The, is it the case that the, the project is proceeding on schedule and that there would be only limited scope now for that schedule to be significantly short? Sure. That, that's exactly right, yes. I mean, I've, I've been asked that question on many occasions, including at the recent pub, public briefings, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's certainly something I would not claim that we could do better than we're currently predicting. There's very limited scope, really, at this point, but it's something we continue to monitor very closely, and should there be a change in that, obviously, we would update the committee appropriately. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You've got a supplementary on that specific point? Thank you. Uh, perhaps the project director could say something about the technical term of optimism bias, which I understand was an initial contract, which, as members may know, is the psychological aspects of contracts where people tend to overestimate uh, the costs and uh, the ability to get project on time. And that's already in the project cost, is it not? Perhaps the directors could say something about that. There is an element of optimism bias which has always been in the budget, and that's absolutely right. Um, and that's something that, as, as the project has progressed through both the procurement period and now the construction period, that does steadily reduce um, because you, you start off with, with guidance as to what the, the optimism bias should be. And obviously in the early days of the project, when you're still looking at scope and the contractual conditions and so on, you would have quite a significant percentage within the optimism bias. And if it, you, you may remember when we, we first started pre-procurement even, we were talking about potentially a budget of 1.7 to 2.3 billion pounds for the project. And that included a very large element of exactly that optimism bias. But as things have progressed through, that optimism bias has progressively reduced and has been able to be released, which is part of the reason why, again, the budget has been able to come down. Thank you. Alex. Yes. Dave. <coughs> I listened to the news, so uh, the BBC reported in late November last year that Carlo Germani uh, was leaving the project in December last year and that a new project director would be appointed. Uh, has a new project director been appointed uh, at this stage and can you give an assurance that this change has had little impact or no impact on the project? Yes, I can. Um, Carlo left the project um, just before Christmas. Um, FCBC went through a very robust procedure to, to find a, a replacement for him. Uh, and what has happened is that Michael Martin, who had been on the FCBC board for the previous two years, representing Morrison Construction, who were one of the four partners of FCBC, uh, they decided that he was the, the ideal candidate to come forward and become the, the FCBC project director. So he actually took up that role from the 1st of December. So there was a month overlap with Carlo, but obviously have, that, given that he'd been on the board, there'd been a very strong working relationship there prior to that. He knew all about the job. He knew about all the background to the job. He wasn't coming in fresh to it. And I think I can say from my point of view, it's been a very seamless uh, transition from uh, Carlo to Michael. And we, we meet just as regularly as, as I did with Carlo. We have just the same robust um, discussions about how things are progressing. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very happy with the way the whole um, transition has been managed. Given that, uh, can we assume then that the highest degree of continuity has been achieved in that change? I think we can, yes. Thank you. OK. Um, James. OK, thanks very much. Uh, in November last year, you announced that Amy had the contract to uh, maintain the, the fourth road bridges. Could you give me an update on, on how you've been engaging with Amy to ensure the smooth handover? Yeah, sure. Um, Amy were awarded the, the fourth bridges operating company contract in December, and um, they're now in their first of two mobilisation periods. The first mobilisation period leads up to the start of June when they take um, control or um, they, they start the, the contract in, in for, for real, um, maintaining <coughs> initially the, the fourth road bridge and the connecting road network from Halbeith in the north, um, at the top of just off the top of the plan, actually right the way down to the junction 1A uh, junction that we improved as part of the, the fourth replacement crossing project in the south. So it's not a particularly long section of road, but obviously it includes the fourth road bridge. So that's 1st of June, they, they, they're due to take that over. And they also have a second mobilisation period, which is really the Queensferry Crossing and the uh, connecting roads that are being constructed as part of the principal contract. And they will uh, be responsible for the maintenance and operation of the bridge and those connecting roads, obviously, when they're, they're fully open to traffic at the end of 2016. As part of that second mobilisation period, um, they will be um, taken on board in terms of 
uh, understanding the nuances of the of the Queensferry crossing, all the mechanical and electrical systems, all the different maintenance regimes that they'll have to use um, to properly look after the bridge um, throughout its life. Um, so we'll um, have a series of site visits with them. We've already started that process and there's been several visits already with, with FETA, um, the, the current um, maintaining authorities, I'm sure you're well aware, and with Amy themselves. I think there's a site visit uh, programmed in the next few weeks, actually, in the, in the series of visits. So that will become more and more um, intense as we get closer to the opening of the bridge. Um, the contract itself is a five-year contract which can be extended to, to 10 years by, by agreement in yearly increments. And obviously um, the FETA facilities which are at the, the uh, south side of the Fourth Road Bridge um, will become uh, occupied or the ownership of Transport Scotland and Amy will be able to, to use those facilities. But the one other thing I was just going to mention on the, the contract is um, we have recently, uh, through the, the, the project, um, reconfigured part of FETA's offices to, to form uh, what will become a bridge control room for both the bridges. Um, so we've uh, now extended part of the what used to be the conference room in the FETA building um, to, to enable our contractor to, to, to fit out that room with all the facilities to, to monitor the bridge, the Queensbury Crossing I'm talking about in, in the initially. Um, so all the security systems, CCTV, all the structural health monitoring systems and all the, the different um, things that you'd expect in a, in a bridge of that scale um, in, will be housed in that room. And then later when FCBC have finished doing that, um, some of the control systems or most of the control systems for the existing fourth row bridge will be added to that room. So there'll be a, a proper um, first class facility for maintaining both of the bridges. Okay, no, no further questions. Thank you. Mary. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask some questions around community engagement? And Mr Climey, in your opening remarks, you said community relations were very good. And I know as the project has progressed that um, working with the community to, to, to deal with their concerns and minimise the impact of the construction has been a, a key issue for you. And the committee has written to local residents groups seeking details of concerns. And you'll know that key concerns that have been raised are around... Um, mud from construction vehicles on the road, the speed of vehicles and the impact of construction noise. So can you tell me what progress has been made to alleviate those concerns? Certainly. I think to, to put those um, comments in, into context, um, it's very important to, um, to note that we have our community forums, which meet on a quarterly basis, which were spe specifically established to deal with exactly these issues, to make sure that we are engaging with the community, addressing the issues as they arise and making sure they are properly dealt with. Um, in terms of the noise, we also have the Noise Liaison Group, which meets on a monthly basis, and we review all the, any complaints that have been received relating to noise, and we also monitor all the noise and vibration monitoring data, which we collect from a wide range of sources across the whole site, both on the north side and on the south side. Um, inevitably, with the, with, with the work we're doing, uh, particularly over the last 12 months or so, we've been doing specific work on the A904, which is very close to people's residences, obviously, and also with the work at Ferry Toll, that has become quite, uh, quite more significant. Uh, we are fortunate there in that we don't really have any residences close by, but obviously mud on the road there is, has been an issue. We're, we're aware of that. A lot of work has been put into making sure we do regular road sweeping and cleaning in the area. Uh, but we also have, a, have challenges in that there are some very limited working areas there. And we're also trying to make sure that throughout all the various phases of the work, we maintain um, full connectivity of the road network and also routes for pedestrians and cyclists through our work area. So a lot of planning work does go into that. And whenever we do receive a complaint or a contact regarding any of these issues, we make sure it's followed up very quickly. Our response has to go back within 48 hours. And we try to make sure these are addressed very quickly and therefore they don't become a, a, if like a running sore on the job. And I think to date we've been very successful in that in terms of the number of, um, of issues that have arisen. I think people have seen that when, when they have raised something, we've addressed it in a, in a timely manner. And that's something we're, we're, we're in, we will continue to do throughout the project. OK. Mr Shannon, is there anything you wanted to add? No. No, just in terms of um, mud on road, for example, um, the code of construction practice... Um, um, basically says that we've got to be um, employ measures which are reasonably practicable and in some of the areas um, 
it's very difficult, if not impossible, to actually get dedicated wheel washing facilities for, for wagons that are accessing their, those areas, particularly around the ferry toll junction, for example. And so we're, um, we're on the contractor's case all the time to make sure that um, the roads are kept as clean as they possibly can be, bearing in mind that it's very difficult to actually put a bespoke, uh, dedicated wheel washing facility in those particular areas. Um, having said that, there are dedicated wheel washing areas both on the south side and on the north side, um, which service um, pretty vast areas of construction site. So not only does the contractor FCBC have wheel washes, uh, washing uh, vehicles out both on the north and the south side, but we're um, monitoring that work and make sure that um, everything is done as, as quickly as possible. And it is a challenge, as, as David mentioned, to, to keep mud off the road, particularly in the winter when it's wet and there's also grip from the, the salting process to, to keep the, the, the roads free from ice. Um, but yes, it's a, a, a number one issue that we're, we're really making sure that we, we address. And has, has the, the number of complaints and concerns raised, has that diminished any since the construction work has, has, has started or has it increased and dropped off? Is, is there any kind of um, methodology to, to why people are complaining? Um, I can certainly give you some figures. Uh, the, the average um, complaint number of complaints per month since we started work in August 2011 is six. Um, and I think last year when we came to, to this committee, it was five. So just a, a minor increase in the number of, of complaints. And I think um, they range from topics such as noise, vibration issues, traffic management, um, the dust and mud issues that we've just been um, talking about and some various other miscellaneous issues. So it's a, it's a, a range of issues and I think as, as we've been um, interfacing with the public roads more and dealing with construction near to people's properties, the, the number of, of issues, not, well, not necessarily complaints, has, has risen. But on, on the positive side of things, although we do have some complaints, I think we've had 996 inquiries across the project in general, Recently, we've had a lot more positive comments about, um, I'm pleased to see that you're building this road to, to, to incorporate footpaths of a good wide standard, good um, cyclist facilities. People are seeking more information about final junction layouts, and they're, they're interested to know about the project. So it's not just the, the negative side, there are, there are quite a lot of positives. The project has progressed. People have been able to, to see how it's developing, and, yes. and has that changed the engagement they have with you? Yeah, I mean, to, to some extent, the, we have the, the community forums, and I think we've now had 35 community forums over the, the last uh, four years in total. Um, they meet every three months. Um, but we've also had an, a, a huge number of people visiting the Contact and Education Centre um, all through the last um, summer, and we're just about to start again in, in March. We have the contact centre as, a, a, as an exhibition or an open day, if you like, every Saturday, so people are, uh, can drop in, and we've certainly had literally thousands of people doing that, and we have members of our staff there to answer any questions they have, and they can view the models, the exhibition boards, um, we give, provide presentations, um, recently, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, as David mentioned at the, the beginning, we had some, a series of public and stakeholder meetings and we had over 400 people come to those meetings to find out about not only what we've done over the last year or so to bring them up to, up to date with the project, but also looking forward, as, as David highlighted as well, over the next couple of years and the key activities. And they, they were really uh, very positive, the, the responses we got from people. Thank you. Newton Community Council in particular have raised concerns um, and I'm sure you'll, you'll be aware of them and I wonder if you could perhaps give us an update on where you are with their concerns around the, the traffic lights which have been installed to mitigate the impact of the high volume of traffic. Um, and the Community Council have stated the speed of a significant proportion of the vehicles travelling through the village is still a concern. They're also concerned around the, the pollution monitoring equipment which has been installed in the village um, because they, they, they've reported to us that the data from the equipment is not always easy to find and interpret. So can you give us an update on where you are with those concerns that have been raised? Yes, certainly. I think Newton is one particular area where 
we should actually be celebrating a success. Uh, when we came to speak to you a year ago, uh, at that point we had, we had the first year of data of the M9 Junction 1A operating. And that, what that had done is that had resulted in traffic flows through Newton on the A904, uh, reducing by 13% overall, and the number of heavy goods vehicles was down by 52%. Now, following that, the, the traffic lights which you mentioned were installed in August 2013, and we've now got a year of data of, of those having been in operation as well. And what we found is that um, in the second year of operation, traffic on the A904 is now down by 24% overall, and the number of HGVs is down by 68%. So I think that the, having actually put the traffic lights in there, um, along with perhaps the more of our more intrusive works on the A904 at the South Queensford Gyratory, have encouraged more people not to use that route and to go around through M9 Junction 1A. Um, obviously also there, with the reduction particularly in the HGVs, that's also going to have seen an improvement in the, the air quality in the area. Um, one thing that I think has been identified there is that the actual location of the air monitoring equipment there is perhaps not ideal because it's, it's being, I think, um, it's getting results from other, other, other factors other than the, the road traffic in that it's quite close to, I think, I believe some people's houses and there's some building work going on. So therefore that's being looked at at the moment to see if perhaps a re-siting of the monitor would produce a, a, a more accurate um, um, set of data in order to be able to uh, monitor this. But it's something we'll, we will continue to monitor year by year going forward. We have traffic counters there. Um, in terms of the, of the speeding in the area, um, obviously we've put additional signage in place. Uh, we do talk with Police Scotland at our Traffic Management Working Group, which also meets on a monthly basis, um, both on the A904 area and through Newton itself, uh, with passing on these concerns, because obviously it, it's a police issue that, to, to actually come out and, and check for, for speeding. Um, and they've, they've been out on a number of occasions and certainly have, have found that they're, they've, they've uh, caught a number of people. Um, but it's something that we are, we're keen to keep pushing as much as we can. Thank you. Yes, the, the, um, the, the finding the results, um, the, 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 the air quality monitoring device, which is known as a TOM, I won't um, go through all the words for what that stands for because it's quite a um, quite confusing phrase. Um, but it's quite a sophisticated piece of equipment. It was installed by our contractor, but it's actually owned and operated by West Lothian Council and they provide the data that comes out of that device to the Scottish Air Quality website. Um, so that's the main source of the full data that's provided by that um, device. Um, the, um, the particulate matter, which is what the, our contractor has to record, um, the information is, is also lodged on our website for that information. So that may be why, what's confusing the community council there. So we'll clarify that with them anyway. Yeah, they help. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Adam. Uh, yes, gentlemen, can I ask you, have any new areas of concern been highlighted to you during recent community forum events? Oh, um, I, I'd have to say that in terms of the community forums, um, the number of items that have been raised in recent meetings, we actually have got the North Forum tonight and the South Forum uh, next week. Um, the length of the meetings and the number of issues that has been raised by the community um, councils in particular has actually reduced quite a lot over the last couple of meetings. Um, and they've been more um, taking on board um, the programming of the upcoming works, obviously alerting us to the need to, to minimise impact on the local roads and to the, the local communities in terms of the, the issues that we've mentioned before, the dust, noise, traffic management, that kind of thing, which we're always at pains to try and minimise. Um, so in terms of general issues, um, on the north side, um, I think some concern perhaps about the ferry toll junction works um, and to try and um, make sure that people have got the best information on, on ferry toll junction works. We told the, um, the community forum um, that we were going to have a, a series of public meetings to explain the upcoming phasing because there's a, a huge number of phases to actually get the existing road network um, into its final form and form the, the ferry toll junction and to realign the A90 over the new bridge rather than over the fourth road bridge, um, some 15 or so phases. Um, so we had a, a series of meetings in the autumn on the back of that issue being raised at the forums, um, which were well attended events in North Queen's Free in Verkeeling, Resyth. Um, and also at the Contact and Education Centre. 
and um, we ask people to sign up for email alerts um, for all the upcoming changes to the traffic management and I think we have over 350 people signed up for that information. We've issued 10 different email alerts now and we've been encouraging people whenever we, we speak to the public or stakeholders, particularly at the, the public meetings um, a couple of weeks ago, um, to sign up for these alerts so they'll be fully aware of the, the particular phase that the, the traffic management is in at any particular time. We haven't um, put all the phases out because there's a possibility that some of the phases could be swapped round and discrete changes made. So we don't want to confuse people. So basically follow the, the website, get these email alerts, and we'll update people at the community forums and through the project update and the website um, accordingly. So that's one, one issue on the north side. South side, I think, is more um, concern about perhaps the timing of the completion of the Queen's Free Junction works. Um, We've, we're now basically uh, uh, pretty well complete for the Queen's Free Junction. Um, they were very keen to understand when that work was going to be finished. We issued a huge number of um, project updates, um, uh, letter drops through um, doors in the vicinity um, to, to try and make sure that people understood when the works were being carried out in the different phases there. And as I say now, that the works in that area are largely complete. There's some of the um, cycleways, pavements, some of the mounding and uh, tree planting are, are continuing in that area, um, and that will be the vast majority, vast majority of the works around the, the Queensbury Junction, Eckland Corner area completed. So that's one of the issues from the south. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, my apologies for missing your introductory remarks and this question that you might have covered. Can you explain why it has been necessary to re reduce the speed limit between the Eklund and Admiralty Junctions from spring this year um, until the Queen's Ferry crossing opens? Yes, um, the reason for putting the average speed cameras in place is um, because we're on the, particularly on the north side, we're going to have to divert the northbound carriageway over onto the new structures and that's going to happen toward in the late spring. So at that point, we're going to be working in much more close proximity to traffic. Uh, we have an obligation, which is very important, to maintain two lanes of traffic in each direction on the main line throughout all the work that we do, apart from occasional um, night work. Um, but it's very important to us that we can maintain those, those two lanes of traffic in either direction. And the safest way to do that is to have the 40 mile an hour speed limit, because at times we will be working very close to the traffic. Now, the thought of, we did look at, could we have a short section at the south end around Scotston and then a short section at the north end around Ferry Toll and not have it over the Forth Road Bridge? But as I mentioned earlier, what we have found is that obviously our works are a significant distraction to traffic when it's crossing over the Forth Road Bridge. Traffic is slowing down on the Forth Road Bridge anyway. So therefore, it seemed to make sense and it will avoid driver confusion to have the average speed cameras all the way from the Scotston Junction in the south through to the Admiralty Junction in the north. And as also mentioned earlier, the, the effect of that on the travelling public is less than one minute in terms of additional travelling time. And our experience has actually been that the average speed cameras improve the traffic flow rather than inhibit it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay. Uh, the committee recently uh, con contacted several of the community representative groups based in the area which was affected by the construction work um, of, the, of the recrossing. Uh, we received two very helpful responses from the North Queensferry Residents Group and from Newton Community Council, which have informed their questions uh, to you uh, this morning. Another community representative group uh, that you'll be familiar with, the Bridge Replacement Interest Group, did indicate, however, that, however, that it did not have sufficient time to consult with the groups uh, it represents and respond to the committee within our time scale. It will instead write to us at a later stage to provide us uh, with its views. Can I seek an agreement from you uh, that the committee can write to the project team seeking a response to any pertinent issues that arise from their representations? Certainly, yeah, we'd be very happy to, to deal with that. We're very familiar with that group. Um, I don't think any of the issues that they may raise with you will come as a surprise to us. So I'm sure that we'll be able to provide you a, a response if you, if you write to us with any specific concerns. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Mike. Uh, okay, <coughs> convener, uh, just a couple of brief questions about the public uh, transport uh, strategy. Oh, and I wonder if you could provide the committee with an update on the work of the public transport working group and what the key developments have been there over the last year. Sure. Um, the 
the meeting, uh, the, the, the working group meets on a six monthly basis or, or thereabouts and we're due to meet um, uh, on the 30th of March is the next meeting. And um, it's a mixture of Transport Scotland um, people, my, myself actually on the, the working group, Fife Council, West Lothian Council, City of Edinburgh Council, Sestran, First Bus, Stagecoach, um, Confederation of Pas Passenger Transport and our own uh, team uh, consultants. Um, the way it's standing at the moment is there's a, a second revision is lodged on our website on, in the public domain and it has a whole series of um, potential um, schemes that could be raised sort of beyond the scope of the, the, the project that we're actually building at the moment. It does also contain some of the, the, the projects that are within the, the scope of the project, such as the bus hard shoulder running schemes that we've already implemented and are seeing a, a, a running um, uh, very well, um, helping buses to, to, to skip some of the queuing traffic, particularly on the approach to Newbridge, for example. Um, we've, um, we also monitor some of the other uh, um, performance of, of the scheme, that, particularly the bus lane on the Fife ITS contract. Um, that's a, quite a talking point at the workshops. Um, that was originally envisaged as being a temporary arrangement um, for the construction phase of the project, but the, the working group, most of the members are, are very keen to make that a permanent facility, particularly in view of the fact that it's, it runs between the Howbeath Park and Ride, which opened at the end of 2013 and is on the, the main conduit to, to the crossing of the fourth. So it seems sensible as, as demand increases um, that there's a, a good um, chance for, for public transport or buses to use the hard shoulder running facility and bypass any potential queues. So we monitor that and we, we, we inform the group about what's going on with that. And as I say, it's, it's working successfully. We've, we find that I think 12 buses typically use that bus lane um, in, in the morning periods. Um, we also talk about some of the other aspects of the project, the managed crossing strategy itself and how buses will eventually be able to use the Forth Road Bridge, um, but also the Queensbury Crossing if there's high winds affecting the Forth Road Bridge to, to make sure that we have junk, uh, bus journey time reliability. Um, and also the ferry toll park and ride is going to be improved, the access and egress arrangement there, so we, we, we give an update on that. Um, obviously that's part of the main contract around the uh, ferry toll junction and some of the work is progressing uh, as we speak there. The wider issues we talk about, one of the big issues over the last year has been um, Newbridge Interchange, which is right at the very southern end of the project corridor, if you like, and a public transport corridor study is currently underway there, um, which is a jointly funded um, study between Transport Scotland, City of Edinburgh Council and West Lothian Council um, to, to try and see how bus movements in particular across and around that junction can be improved. Um, in the longer term. I think it's, it's quite a challenge to make sure that um, everything uh, will work um, to a, a, a much, better, much more reliable degree in the future. But that is uh, one of the main focuses. It seems to be a, a main bottleneck for public transport, particularly from the local authorities' point of view. Um, so that study is now um, ongoing. There's a, another series of issues. We monitor the park and ride I mentioned at, at Halbeath. Um, which now is a, a thousand uh, car facility and is used by around 480 to 500 cars every day. So it's about half full. And f as I understand it from the bus companies, that's a, um, a normal sort of thing. It takes quite a while, quite a number of months or years to actually get the patronage right up to the maximum capacity. Ferry toll park on ride is already at, the, at the, the maximum capacity. So that's a positive that people are getting out of there cars and using the public transport to get um, to, to, to move to destinations south of the fourth. Um, out of the other interventions, and I think there's around 20, 25 of them all together, um, we look at the development of one ticketing um, with the potential migration to smart ticketing, which is a, a SESTRAN initiative. I, I can't say that I'm particularly close to that particular initiative. Um, but that's being investigated to try and help with, with ticketing of, of public transport measures in and around Edinburgh, really, and uh, uh, the Lothians. Um, marketing of the facilities to encourage more use of the park and ride. Um, we also have our colleagues from Traffic Scotland 
um, contribute to the group now because we're hoping to use the, vir uh, the variable message signs to encourage people out of their cars and onto the buses by displaying signs such as it's 20 minutes from this particular point by car to um, Barnton or wherever it might be. But if you go by bus, it would be 10 minutes. I'm just talking theoretically, but trying to give an example of, you know, if you got out of your car, then you'd actually get there quicker. So that kind of thing. Um, there are some other uh, more physical initiatives being looked at, potential uh, for some slip roads linking the B800 um, to what was referred to as the M9 spur, it's the M90 now, um, to try and um, bypass some of the, the major um, road works or road corridor um, congested roads um, so that buses get a better priority down towards the airport and the Newbridge Junction. That's one of the, the potential initiatives. I think I've said enough. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> well, that was a pretty comprehensive answer and you've You've kind of partially preempted my second question. It was just, a, a, and forgive me if you actually mentioned this, but maybe uh, uh, escaped me. The, the study that you uh, mentioned, the joint study that Edinburgh Council are participating in, wh when is that due to be concluded or to report? Um, I think it's a six month study off the top of my head. Um, I think it's six months or so. Yeah, it's Thank not a you. particularly long study. If I could just see, I mean, ev every aspect of this project seems to be a kind of paragon of good practice in public sector procurement and delivery of projects. Other lessons that have been learned, can we look forward to this being the kind of standard of excellence that will be applied for all public sector infrastructure projects? So. Yeah. Um, but no, I think there's a little lot of work is, is going in to make sure that we do capture the lessons learned from what we've done on this project, and that's both within Transport Scotland for our other major projects, but also within the wider Scottish Government as well. Um, I think actually Lawrence participated in a, a wider Scottish Government uh, lessons learned workshop um, a couple of weeks ago. Yes, yeah, that's right. I mean, there was colleagues there from um, prisons, building prisons, hospitals, schools, all these kind, kind of things. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a road or a bridge that's, that's being procured, but general um, uh, experience that we've learnt through, I use the word governance, is really the, the key to everything and, and planning out projects well, um, making sure that they've got the right budget, you've got the right information at the right time, obviously the right people to advise you um, through the, the course of it. I mean, I could go on about this for, for hours on end, but it's, it sounds simple, but it, actually putting it into practice is uh, quite, a, quite a trick to, to, to have to master. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. David? Uh, thank you. Um, how many apprentice, apprentices are currently employed on your project? Uh, apprentices, we currently have 14, but that's part of a much wider um, training scheme that we have on the project. Um, obviously, apprentices are part of the vocational training, as we call it, and, and, and across the whole project, we currently have about 1,200 people on the site, and there's 133 of those are currently undertaking vocational training at an SVQ level two or above, and that, that obviously includes the 14 specific apprentices. Um, so the cumulative um, annual average that we've got in terms of training is uh, just under 100, it's actually 96.4 in terms of vocational training. Um, the modern apprentices, they're all from the Fife, Lothian, Edinburgh area. Uh, they're going, they're in, enrolled at either Edinburgh uh, College, Carnegie College or Perth College. Um, of those, 10 are training as civil engineering technicians. There's two as electricians, uh, one as a welder and fabricator, and one as a business administrator. And in addition to that, we also have professional training, which is training to become chartered engineers or chartered surveyors. Um, we've currently got 20 people going through that process. And cumulatively to date, uh, we've got an annual average of 39 people who've been going through, through that. And within Transport Scotland itself, within our group, the Employers Delivery Team, uh, we've successfully got 12 people through to chartered engineer status actually on this project, which I think is something we're, we're very pleased about, very proud of. Um, we've also done work with the long-term unemployed. Um, we've currently got 71 people out of the 1,200 working on the site who had previously been unemployed for at least 25 weeks and that equates to a, an annual average of 48.5 in terms of what we've done throughout the project. So we set some fairly stretched targets at the start of the project in terms of minimum requirements, in terms of annual average, 
and I'm very pleased that the contractor is, is significantly ahead in, in all three areas, both in the vocational training, the professional training and the long-term unemployed. How have these figures varied uh, throughout the contract? Do you expect that number to be fairly stable? Um, but was there more at the start or do you expect more at the end? Or is the number you quoted going to be about the same through the whole project period? I think what will happen on the vocational training, I think it will be much the same throughout the period. We're at a fairly stable level now in terms of the numbers on the site. Uh, we're going to stay around the 1,200 number pretty well through to completion. Um, what, will, what may start to drop off a little bit is the professional training for engineers, in that they were, that was quite heavily weighted towards the design phase, because obviously it is a design and build contract. So therefore, that tended to be front-end loaded in terms of the professional training places. Uh, in terms of long-term unemployed, that took a bit longer to ramp up. In the first couple of years, we were actually falling below our annual average on the long-term unemployed because at that point there wasn't so much site work going on, so there weren't as many opportunities in that particular area. But it's very encouraging to see that we've now moved ahead of the target that we had, and we're, we're confident that we can maintain that right through to completion now. Uh, Convener, my, my own uh, personal view is that any large public uh, sector contract should have a community benefit. Um, can you remind the committee whether there was any element of community benefit in the project for which stated that there should be a, a training provision for the successful bidder? Yes, there was. Uh, we, we set very specific requirements in terms of a KPI. and In terms of the principal contract, what we specifically asked them to do and what put it into the contract was that they had to deliver an annual average of 45 vocational training positions, 21 professional body training places, and 46 positions for the long-term unemployed. So those were specific contract requirements. We deal with those as a, as a KPI, a key performance indicator, and there are actually mechanisms within the contract that there could be a financial penalty to the contractor if those were not achieved. Uh, and also in parallel with that, we asked the, the, two, the two bidding contractors in the, in the dialogue phase to put forward their proposed KPIs for how they could also benefit the community. And the, the winning contractor, FCBC, put forward a number of areas where they, they, they thought that they could deliver that. And those were also built into the contract as part of the KPI regime. And that particularly was in terms of funding for community projects. Um, it included uh, PhD students. It included opportunities for further education students, students to gain work experience on the site. So although we set some minimum requirements within the contract, we also encouraged the contractor to provide extra in their, in their, in their um, bid to us, and that was actually evaluated as part of the quality evaluation of the two bids that we received. I'm certainly very pleased to hear that's a very positive story. My next question uh, is about the evidence you gave, I think, a year ago. You gave an assurance to the committee that you keep a watching brief on the issue of blacklisting by contractors. Can you give the committee an, an absolute insurance today that there's absolutely no blacklisting by contractors on this project? If I can. And that's something I specifically, I gave you that um, reassurance a year ago. It's something I specifically sat down and asked Michael Martin, the new project director of FCBC, earlier this week before I came to the committee. And he gave me exactly the same categorical assurance that there has been no blacklisting on the project and there's no intention there ever would be. And my final question, convener, um, is again, can you remind the, the, uh, the committee whether there was any assurances when the contract was awarded? Uh, that the successful uh, contractor had to register all employees within the, UK, within the UK for national insurance purposes? I don't think there was that specific requirement, but there's certainly an obligation in the contract that they must um, comply with all UK, UK laws and legislation, which I think would, would cover that particular issue. So there is a general obligation that they absolutely must comply with all legislation, but there wasn't that specific point you raised identified as, as, as a particular point. Perhaps I can put the question slightly differently. Are all employees on the project registered in the UK for national insurance purposes? Yes, I believe they are. That's an absolute assurance. There's no employees registered abroad and are exempt from national insurance. Certainly not as far as I'm aware. Right. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Thank you. Do members have any further questions for the project team? Alex. The, going back slightly to the, the structure of the bridge and its uh, future management, uh, and I wanted to raise the issue of lighting for a number of reasons. Uh, I presume that for marine navigation purposes, the foot of the towers are already lit uh, during the hours of darkness. Is that the case? Or marked by lights, if that's... The, they are marked by lights, that's correct. And also yes. the navigation channels are marked on the, the deck of the bridge as well to identify where the navigation channels are. Um, in relation to, to sufficient navigation clearance on the bridge. Yes. So I presume that arrangements uh, are in hand to improve the lighting should it be necessary, but uh, essentially that part of the job is done already. That 
It is, yes. Yeah. We actually go through an extensive um, uh, collaboration with Forth Ports, who are the, the managing authority for all traffic mm. within, the, within the river. Uh, so therefore we've gone through a consultation with them and they actually have to sign off with a certificate to confirm that they are in agreement with everything that's being provided in terms of navigational lighting for the project. I noticed that there's already uh, warning lights uh, on the tops of the towers uh, and of course they will go up as the towers go up. Uh, what are the plans for illuminating the tops of the towers or marking the tops of the towers with lights uh, after the completion of construction? Uh, and are there likely to be any issues uh, regarding the, the presence of these lights in terms of local population? What is required there, we have to have aircraft navigation warning lights, which are similar to the ones on the existing Forth Road Bridge. Uh, so there's a fixed light that has to be in position, and I think also a flashing light that has to be in position on the top of each tower. So it's similar lighting in accordance with the uh, requirements of the Civil Aviation Authority. And again, we have to consult with them to make sure that we are in full compliance with their requirements. So again, there's a certificate that has to be provided that says the lighting that's being provided is fully in compliance with CAA requirements. Will that be white lights or will it be red lights or will it be a mixture? I believe it's a mixture. I think there's a fixed red light and a mm -hmm. white flashing light. I'm not an expert on this, but that's, I, I believe, so that's what's on the existing Forth Road Bridge and I believe yes. it will be similar for, for our structure as well. Uh, and a different aspect of lighting, uh, will the road deck of the bridge be illuminated during the hours of darkness? Yes, it will. Um, also, maybe I should mention that um, all the lighting on the project on the, on the main roads is going to be an LED type lighting. So we're looking very much at the energy efficiency of that. Um, I think it also has the ability to be, to be dimmed as well, um, should that be deemed the appropriate way to do things. Um, and my other question relating to that was, uh, will that lighting extend over the whole range of the project, uh, including the approach roads? Um, well, there are so, some parts of the the actual bridge itself will only have aesthetic lighting. It won't have true road lighting for the vehicles. It, it'll have um, a ribbon light um, along the, the full length of the deck and the towers will be illuminated and it's um, proposed to be a white light. So it's just a, a ribbon effect. Um, the, the bridge itself won't have road lighting, but there is provision, should we um, deem it um, necessary in the years to come, to put proper road lighting on. Um, there is road lighting north of the ferry toll junction um, because of the, the, it comes down to a road standards issue basically and a volume of traffic issue and the closer the junction spacing the more likely there is for, for safety reasons that you should put in road lighting. Junctions n nearly always have to have um, lighting anyway and also from the Queensbury junction round to the Scotston junction that section will be lit as it is at the moment. So all the existing lighting will be replaced and renewed with the LED lighting. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned the issue of aesthetic lighting. Uh, and of course, the fourth rail bridge has been illuminated for some time. Uh, the, if you are to be using aesthetic lighting on the new bridge, have you taken into account the overall appearance of the area during the hours of darkness and how the lighting on one bridge can complement that on the other? Yeah, that was taken into consideration during the aesthetics review stage of the of the project and when we were um, looking at the form of, and shape of the towers for example and that was a um, huge amount of discussion with architecture and design scotland so they were um, party to to the the different um, arrangements of the towers and also to the lighting and making sure that it was sympathetic with the two existing bridges thank you thank you alex um do members have any no. closing questions? Thank you. Are there any concluding remarks that you would like to make? I don't think so. I think covered things thoroughly. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for your uh, evidence this morning. Can I thank you also for the regular written updates that you provide the committee with on the progress of, of the project? And uh, we look forward to seeing you before us, I think, in about six months' time and again before the completion of the project um, by the end of 2016. Once again, thank you very much. I close this meeting of the committee.